I've got the best book I've ever read, and I've got two books that are really close to it. It's my March wrap-up. Till the last day of this month, I didn't have a single three-star reads. It was all big thumbs up or big thumbs down. We've got book two prize books in this wrap, and we've got a whole bunch of books from the Woman's Prize. Now, let's do a little shout out to a coming video. Uh, I am working with Gem of Books, and we are going to do our prediction for the Woman's Prize shortlist at some point in the future. So if you don't subscribe to Gem's channel, then, I mean, honestly, if you don't subscribe to Gem's channel, fix that up right now. Great channel, great channel, uh, and I guarantee you, you will find something you like in there. Let's start with the DNFs, and we've got A Grain of Wheat by Nagui Wa Tayongoyo. This is a Kenyan classic, and I really, really wanted to like this. I gave this a real red-hot go. I started reading this in February. I wasn't into it. I gave it a break. I came back to it. I tried to read it quick. I tried to read it slow. I tried everything. I could not get into it. It referred to events that had happened that I had no idea had happened. And I actually think that this is the way that the events have been introduced to you to show you people's reaction to them after they've happened. And they're like foreshadowed and then you don't see them happening and then their reaction. I found this really off-putting and I just could not get into this writing style. I couldn't get my head around this writing style. But it does tell the story of Kenyan independence from the English. So it is a story that I really did want to find out more about, but I just couldn't. Lots of study of toxic masculinity in there. I don't know how intentional that was, and I could not get a feel as to whether that was an accurate representation of men at the time, or whether that was the author's own feelings, or other people might actually really get along with this one, but it is really not for me. Let's talk Booktube Prize. Before I talk about the Booktube Prize, let me say that I think that the work that Robert does to run the Booktube Prize is excellent. And I have seen many other people have a positive experience reading their books. Uh, but there is an element of risk you undertake when you agree to be a Booktube Prize judge. I don't think I'll be taking that risk again again personally. I found that judging it and not being able to talk about it does not work for me. I think that's a really weird rule. It's not one that I agree with myself. I do respect the fact that you create a set of rules, that all the judges must follow those sets of rules for consistency's sake. And so, you know, but I can be influenced by people who are not my other judges. So, I mean, I almost would like to have had somebody to discuss these books with to help form my opinions on them. I know that that does allow somebody to sway opinions and the most persuasive person might get their way. So I understand why it is the way that it is, but that's just what I think. Now, the worst book that I read was The Slaughterman's Daughter. I don't know if it was the worst book or the worst translation, but the conversation between the publishing house and the translator must have looked something like this. Would you like to translate this book for us? Sure. What language do I need to translate it into? English. Is that that stupid language that doesn't make sense? Where red doesn't rhyme with lead or something like that? Yeah, that's the one. Everybody reads in that language. There's lots of money to be made. We've got to translate it into English. Do I have to translate every word? How many words were you thinking of translating? I'd, I'd definitely give you 9 out of 10. It's not translated. There's too many words that I don't know the meaning of that are still in Hebrew. And the translation doesn't give you the meaning of those words at any point. And I literally did not know whether they're entering a shopping complex or an airplane or a gas chamber or an ice cream shop. The, the job of a book is to communicate what is going on to you. And if you are going to introduce words in a language that I don't understand, I'm not going to understand what's going on. So you have to provide me context to understand what that word means. You have to provide a definition of that word, or you have to provide something. You could change the sentence structure. Don't just whack it into Google Translate and anything that doesn't have a word, keep it. This is the most inept translation that I have ever come across. 
the book's probably great, but who would who would know? Yeah, I mean, I've just Googled Orshaft. He looks pretty young. If, you, if you're watching this, go get yourself a trade. Plenty of time to learn it. Plumbing's got your name all over it. Uh, at number five is The Art of Losing by Alice Zeniter. This was a pretty long novel, and I read another book that was about the Algerian War of Independence, and that was much less boring. I, how do you make a war of independence boring? It was needlessly long, didn't give me the hooks, it didn't make me want to continue reading it. We're in a civil war, how hard is it to give me a hook, to give me something that I'm invested in to keep reading it? At number four I put Winter and Socko in, and what happened in this book? Yeah, that about sums up the entire worth of this book. And number three was Catch the Rabbit. What are you doing? What's it look like? I'm taking my tampon out. You know the wig only covers so much. Leave my merkin out of this. Did you just throw it out the window? Did you just throw your tampon out the window? What, you'd prefer I to keep it in the car? And anyway, it's not like you pulled over when I needed to pee before. This book is full of bizarre things like that. It doesn't make any sense. There's a random dog on me. He got upset about me getting indignant about a tampon. It's a complete nonsense of ridiculousness, this book. It's just horrible people being horrible to one another for no purpose. There's hints of domestic violence. There's hints of all sorts of things going on. But none of it is explored. You're, you're left wondering why. What's going on? Why am I still wearing a wig during this review? Maybe he's jumping all over me because he thinks I'm on heat. Ultimately, this book is nonsense. This book sets up a whole lot of things and says nothing about them. And the reason it is three on the list and not six is because the other three books are terrible. The writing in this is actually relatively nice. I was able to just follow it and sit with it. And I was able to wait for an explanation for all of the madness. There just isn't one. The number two on my list was Nervous Conditions. I um, actually read this book about six months ago. Uh, it's really literary and I didn't get it. Uh, and number one was Brickmakers by Selva Armada. I object to sequels being in prizes in general. I just, I, I object to sequels in prizes. That was a relatively bad reading experience. All right, let's go on with some of the other books I've read before we go over the women's prize. Somebody Loves You by Mona Arashi. I'm going to be honest with you. When I pulled up my Goodreads and I saw this book on there, I was surprised. It is not only forgettable. If you had have asked me about this book, I would have told you I hadn't read it. But there it is on my Goodreads. I gave it two stars. I reread the synopsis. It kind of sounds familiar, but I could not add to it. So we're going to have to call that one forgettable and move on. George by Alexander Dumas is a book that I would like to do a single book review on. And as such, I'm not going to tell you about it, except to say that I liked it because I like Dumas. But I thought it was actually quite a good Dumas. Uh, and it encouraged me to read another Dumas novel this month. Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death. Oh, blah, blah. I can't even say it, can I? Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death by Selena Godden. This is a bit of a weird one. So the first thing you'll sort of notice about this one is the writing is really nice. It intersperses poetry and really nicely written prose. It's quite lovely. Sort of getting towards some of the, the prettier writing I've had. But I sort of wondered where it was going. It's a very hard book to review. To, to tell you what's going on and to review this would be to give you spoilers. And, and this book really does depend on you going into it blind. Now, for you to go into it blind, you want me to tell you it's one of the best books I've ever read. And it's not. It's a good book. I gave it four stars. But it has flaws. It's not perfect. And at times, it's a little bit boring. At other times, it's quite exciting. I did like the feminization of death. I did like that it was very feminist. I did like the challenging of genders and the non-binary representation in it. But I can't tell you what happened because... The book needs to tell you what happens if you want to read it. And therefore, it makes it very hard for me to do a sales pitch for it. Especially as I'm going to tell you it's 
slightly above average, maybe in the best 40% of books I've ever read, which is not a glowing indictment. <laughs> and what's even more difficult is I'm trying to tell you if you liked X book, try it, but I can't even think of a book that's like it. So um, a lukewarm recommendation with no context for you is what you get for Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death. Um, I'm sorry. I was one of the hosts of the Discworld Readathon where we read Mort. It's the first book in the Death series. It's of course by Terry Pratchett. This is a fantasy comedy series, which is funny. Pratchett has that like really English mocking sense of humor where in the middle of this completely absurd book about death taking on an apprentice, he is poking fun of English bureaucracy. The sense of humour he writes with is brilliant. The world that he builds is absurd, yet it is so clearly influenced by our world and our mythology, yet he puts it on the back of a giant turtle. This was my second time reading Mort, uh, and I've given it four stars. Uh, I liked it better the second time around, to be completely honest. I'm, I'm honestly surprised that more people don't read Terry Pratchett. I think he has this, like, reputation of comedy fantasy in, in the same way that someone like um, The Dresden Files has, which is a horrible series that I don't recommend. It's very much more, it's it's a bit Douglas adams X. it's a bit Catherine Valente. Lots of ridiculous over-the-top descriptions, sort of if Monty Python constructed their sitcom in the form of a sentence with magic around them. Tomorrow they won't dare to murder us. Joseph Andreas. Isn't that a really good title? That's one of the best titles I've ever had. Uh, I said when I was talking about my BookTube Prize books that I was reading books about about the Algerian War of Independence, and I compared The Art of Losing to another book, and this is the book. This book starts with a bang, and it's so fast-paced, it's so exciting, and often a book like this can really get drawn up in the plot, and what I think that this book does really well is to introduce the characters and to let you understand them this is based on the true story of Ferdinand Iveston. Uh, I won't tell you what happened to him. It's easy to look up what happened to him, and it is easy to figure out what happened to him before it actually happens to him in the book, but I do think that that is something that you would like to, to read. It tells the story of him and his wife, the relationship they have, and his fight against the French as part of the Algerian independence movement. It's thrilling. It details torture. It details uh, the barbarity of the French colonialist rule. What I thought was uh, just a really powerful scene is it reminds you of how close this these events were to the Nazi occupation of France and the comparison between the Nazis and the way they treated uh, people who weren't Nazis and the French and the, you know, the comparison to how the French are now treating the Algerians. I thought that that was uh, really powerful. And when it becomes obvious what's going to happen, uh, the, the plot slows down to let you feel the discomfort of what's going on. I I'm going to say something weird because this is a very short novel and it could probably do with being cut a few more pages. That's my reason for giving it four stars and not five stars. It's only 122 pages long and, and yeah, so, so I probably could have been done in a hundred. Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. This is quite simply a really, really good, competent book. It's just, it's a solid five star read for me. It's a queer coming of age story of Molly who really rejects labels. The idea that they're a lesbian is something that they sort of move towards and reject at the same time in this like weird dance because they're not a lesbian they're bi or pan or something like that but that society is sort of telling them well either you're straight or you're you're gay which one are you and they're like i'm not when they go in for the the lesbian culture, then they're sort of, oh, you a butcher or a femme? And, and they're like, um, why do I have to be one of them? 
I thought that that was just such a powerful, like, stop, stop putting a label on it. I'm just, if I want to have sex with you, I want to have sex with you and it'll be a good time. Let's just focus on that rather than what role we're going to play. I thought that exploration was great. The relationship she has with her mother is very broken, but you only see one half of this relationship. You're only seeing it from Molly's point of view. This is really confronted later on when the mother rejects Molly's version of events. You're left wondering, is the mother lying or is Molly lying? What's actually happened? And I think that that's just a fascinating little extra bit of exploring the rejection that a queer person feels when their parents don't accept their identity, especially somebody who is like rejecting all identities. And then when they try and discuss it later on, they try and reconcile what's going on later on. That's not how the parents saw it. It's quite a thought provoking set of circumstances because not only it makes you question what's going on, but it, it makes you question how you should talk to a young queer child so that they don't think that they're attacking you. I just thought that that was brilliant. I think this is a great novel, um, bit of a, a queer classic and definitely, definitely read it. I have a novel that for poor organization reasons, I left out of my last wrap up. That is Living Dead in Dallas by Charlene Harris. That's the second in the Suki Stackhouse series. And I have also read Club Dead, which is the third in the Suki Stackhouse series. This is part of the Coffin Along run by Ange and Amy, two fantastic booktubers who are just absolutely wonderful. And uh, I'm sure you've heard me shout them out before, but if you haven't subscribed to them, stop sitting on it and do it. I've been a bit slack and not participated in the Discord for this readathon because do you know how many Discord groups are run by booktubers? I just, I, I had turned my notifications for Discord off because otherwise my phone runs out of batteries from just constantly vibrating. I've joined too many of them. Uh, I'm a little bit over discorded. I have um, not kept up with that because I have to actually think to check in. I didn't enjoy this one as much as the first Suki Stackhouse novel. And I think that that is the sort of the difference between being able to write one book that could become a standalone book and then finding it successful and having people say, turn it into a series. The will they, won't they aspect of the love is sort of like, well, how are we going to create tension now? And it feels forced. And you're not just trying to resolve that, those sort of things in one book. You, you're trying to stretch it out now over a myriad of books. And that doesn't work for me. It has to be a damn good hook if I'm going to commit 3,000 pages as opposed to 300 pages. This is an enjoyable, fun read. Uh, I'm not particularly thinking about this as my best read for the year. It's just something fun uh, for when I'm in the mood for something a little bit different. It's still relatively well done. I, I like Suki. I like Eric. I definitely am on Team Ange of when the fuck are they getting together. I enjoy the lightheartedness of this. There's not a lot of depth to it. It is just a fun read. And there's nothing wrong with having a fun read in the middle of serious reads. This month was Irish Readathon Month, and I read A Ghost in the Throat by Doreen Negriffa. This was a cool, like, exploration into womanhood, both uh, through Negriffa's current experiences of childbirth and how her role in the family was changing from mother to a different sort of mother, but from breastfeeding to not breastfeeding. It sort of juxtaposed that with this historical figure who was very hard to track down despite her husbands and sons and so on being relatively easy. And it detailed Negriffa's difficulty in finding out about her. I don't really see why this book is so popular. I thought it was well written. I thought it was fine. I, I don't really see how this is challenging ideas or there's nothing interesting or new in this. I think it's a well written book, but I'm only giving it three stars. It didn't provoke thought. These women are erased from history. Well, that's not a surprise. Let's talk about the woman's prize. It really is quite a polarizing woman's prize for me. 
The Final Revival of Opal and Nev is a book that I DNF'd rather quickly. It really reminded me of Taylor Jenkins Reid's uh, The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hugo, which I know is not the Taylor Jenkins Reid's novel it reminds everybody else of. I felt like this is what I imagined Daisy Jones and the Six would be like not having read it. If Taylor Jenkins Reid wrote it after consuming 73 coffees and two lines of speed. Uh, it was so bombastic. Settle down. Let me get with the character before you jump to the next one. It was just all over the place. And I just couldn't. I just couldn't. The Exhibitionist by Charlotte Mendelssohn is actually kind of starts off really strongly with this reference to Anna Karenina and this boorish man saying, I never read Crime and Punishment or whatever it was anyway. And then it doesn't do much else. You've actually created the setting and the characters really wonderfully with this paragraph that is really good. And you have no ambition to do anything else other than that. It just meanders on about this exhibition this artist is doing and how the husband is insecure because he is the superstar and now he's no longer the superstar. And... The third one I DNF'd was Creatures of Passage by Moroa Yadidi. This is just very clearly not a Scott book. Again, a few too many perspectives and too many things going on early in the novel. Uh, and then it's magical realism. And that was just enough for me to go, no, not for me. I have seen Britta talk about this on her channel since I DNF'd this book. Britta doesn't like magical realism either and she enjoyed this. So I might, I might give it another shot, but it will be the last of the women's prize novels I give a shot to, I think. Flamingo by Rachel Elliott is a book that I struggled to get into, to be completely honest, but when I did get into it, I found it really quite rewarding. This very weird story about friendship and family and belonging tells the story of this woman and her son who come and they live next door to this uh, family, and the six of them form this weird friendship and bond and attachment to each other. I thought it was quite lovely and wonderful and very playful at times. We have this sort of multiple timelines going on where we're looking back at this relationship between these two families living next door to each other and really hitting it off. And at some point in the future where the son is tracking down these neighbours that he hasn't seen for quite some time, we don't really know what's happened and why it's happened. I thought that this was wonderful. The question of identity and the questioning of traditional family structures, I thought was wonderful. The idea of helping each other out and what everybody brings to a relationship was great. Ultimately, I think that I would have actually liked another 20 or 30 pages on the end of this book where it finished. I just wanted to, I wanted to see that little bit more. Careless by Christy Kate. I've seen this book being described as YA a few times, and I want to say I technically think it is YA, but if you think that that means this book is not for you, then you're wrong. This is a book about a teenage girl who is pregnant. She is adopted, and she is not secure in her place of living despite having lived there for 11 years. She doesn't feel loved where she is. And this creates this weird, like she is like trying to push back against the family structure to establish herself, which is such a 15 year old girl thing. She finds out she's pregnant. She has this friend who is, you know, that, that friendships that you have when you're a teenager, you know, just how close that you get. And that's wonderfully described. Her friend is a second generation immigrant. That is, she's not an immigrant. Her parents are. Uh, there is discussion of racism in it. These are all the issues that 15-year-old uh, girls might find themselves up against. So I guess it technically is written for a 15-year-old girl. But boy, is it heavy. It's emotional. It's turgid. It's... It's just fabulously done. I, I really could get on board with these characters. I just think that this is wonderful. And whether it's YA or literary fiction, I don't know. Why does it need to be labelled? It's just a good book. And it's a book that, whether it's YA or not, if you read 
literary fiction, if you read works like, I mean, if you read books about emotional experiences, something like the Sally Rooney sort of side of things, then this is a book that will appeal to you. Uh, and it's five stars. The Island of Missing Trees by Alif Shifak is a sort of a very weird story, which uh, is half the time being narrated by a fig tree and half the time is telling you the story of this girl at school and her parents and how they got together, all taking place in either London, if you're talking about the, the daughter, or uh, Cyprus. Uh, if you're talking about the parents, one parent is a, a Greek Cyprian and the other parent is a Turkish Cyprian. And of course, that's this sort of love is taking place during the Cyprian Civil War. I had big expectations for this book after reading 10 minutes and 38 seconds in this world. I had big expectations and it didn't live up to them. It is a very good book, but it is not 10 minutes and 38 seconds in this world good. It is, it's just not at that level. I did enjoy, I actually really enjoyed the auntie in, in this novel. Her sayings, I, 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 I like to think that they're all legitimate cliches that are used by Cyprian women, but they just added an element of humour that I very much enjoyed. What I didn't like about this book was the use of this tree as a metaphor for other things. It just, it just felt heavy handed and it didn't feel, feel elegant. It didn't feel nice. It's, it feels all encompassing and it doesn't quite reach it. The migration of the tree from one place to another to represent the family's migration, the, the change of the tree for climate, so how the tree fits in by being buried and, and like the stand in it is for culture. It doesn't really fit together for me. The, the story of the girl and her bullying at school, yeah, I quite enjoyed that. The auntie's visit, I quite enjoyed that. The love story between the parents, I quite enjoyed that. There's a lot of merit in this book. It's a good book. Read the book. But don't go into it expecting it's going to be Alif Shafak's best work. Uh, also, if you're a fan of trees, butterflies or anything like that, you might just get a little bit more out of this book because there's a lot of that sort of stuff in there. The Bread the Devil Need. Firstly, I did not get that title until I read the book. It's in dialect and the whole book is written in this Caribbean dialect. It's a book about domestic violence. One woman is is in a, an abusive relationship and she doesn't want to leave the abusive relationship. I thought that what Lisa Allen Augustini did by creating tension in scenes just by introducing this character who is beating his woman just by having him being in the room because you know what he's doing it just it was so wonderfully done i mean obviously it wasn't wonderful but the the way it was written was masterfully done it didn't require anything other than his presence to completely change the emotion and the setting and the fear you felt towards uh, the characters in this book. That's incredible. That alone is worth the price of the book. This is a book that I could not help comparing to How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House. And I will say that if you enjoyed that, that this is a book that is for you. I very much did enjoy that book and I very much did enjoy The Bread the Devil Need. I will say that I did think that How the One-Armed Sister was a little bit stronger. I think that what Alan Augustini does well, she does really well. I think the resolution to things left a lot to be desired. I, I didn't like... She had this conflict that she wanted to write about and she wrote about it and she didn't know how she was going to resolve it. And then she, she does resolve it, but I didn't think that that was particularly well done and and that's the reason why i'm giving it four stars if you just want to sit in uncomfortable relationships and domestic violence then wow is this uh oh the how the characters add to the settings and the feelings oh really well done maybe i'm being a little bit mean and giving it four and not five because how well that was done is uh, i don't know of another book that is quite 
quite that good, so effortlessly changing the feeling. I got my three best to talk about. Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. I gotta be honest, I read this book and I said, this is going to win the woman's prize. This is exceptional. This will be one of the best books I read this year. This is just amazing. I've seen this book create some divisive opinions on uh, on booktube and for the life of me I can't understand why you would not like this book if you don't like this book you read for a different reason to what me if you don't like this book you read for something else that I don't read for that's it's it's that simple this is an exploration of mental illness Martha our main character, has spent her entire life suffering from mental illness and it affects her relationship. It affects her relationship with her mother and with her partners. Uh, her mother is alcoholic and she has quite a broken relationship with her mum, not just because of her mental illness, but because of her mum's alcoholism. I think that that double acts really wonderful. I've seen this being compared to Sally Rooney. I think that that is simultaneously a very fair and a very unfair description of it because this does what Sally Rooney does in a novel better than Sally Rooney does it so if you like Sally Rooney you will like this book in fact you will love this book it is quite simply better than Sally Rooney in any way I could measure and think of but it also does more than Sally Rooney it also appeals to authors who maybe think Sally Rooney is a bit meh or average. I think that there is more in this book than is in any one of the Rooney books I've read. I love the literary references in this. It it was not lost on me that Zelda Fitzgerald, that Sylvia Plath, that James Joyce, that Virginia Woolf all suffered from mental illness themselves. The author chose literary figures to reference in her novel that would compound the experience of her characters. There's a dark sense of humour running through this and there's dealing with the fact that you're nearly 40 in this and is this mental condition just your life? There is idealisation of suicide and the normalisation of suicidal thoughts in this character's head. It's Oh my god, it's as a character portrait and getting inside the head of a character, it is so and such a powerful discussion of mental illness. And I could not think how another book on the woman's prize was going to come close to this book. And then I read Ruth Lezek, and we have a contest because I can't tell you which one is best between these two yet. But the Book of Form and Emptiness deals with a child, and this child is dealing with the loss of his father and he can hear voices the scissors talk to him the spoon talks to him the wall talks to him everything talks to him he's got all these voices he can't cope with it he is clearly suffering from a mental illness uh, we see that both these books are suffering from a mental illness both these books also have a very offbeat sense of humor it's comically weird this book uh, on top of the mental illness aspect of Benny, we also have the mother in this book who has lost her husband and doesn't really know how to cope. Kenji, her uh, husband, always brought home the milk so that they were never out of milk. But yet, she just can't cope and she forgets to buy milk all the time because it was never her responsibility. Benny, her mentally ill son, throws a fit because there's no milk in the house and there was always milk when dad was there. And you can see just how devastated this is going to make the mother feel. But you can also understand the son dealing with grief and all of these voices and how he just doesn't have milk for his cereal. Oh my gosh. We have the idealization of a library as a safe place, which can't we just all love that for a bit? We have this coming-of-age novel about this boy, his first crush. We have references to Borges. And it's all wrapped together in this completely weird style. Ozeki has also done something which I just want to take a moment and point out. I can't stand second-person narratives. Second-person narratives are just 
horrible. So to do it so seamlessly and wonderful at times, uh, I really enjoyed Ozeki being able to, to pull that off. This is only the second Ruth Ozeki book I have read, and it is the second book that I have read of Ruth Ozeki that I say is more than five stars. It is better than than a five star novel. I think that these are the two books that we're going to be talking about as the winners of this prize, Sorrow and Bliss, The Book of Form and Emptiness. I can't compare these two because while Meg Mason wrote in, it's almost a simple and nice, lovely writing style, whereas Ozeki was bombastic and it really works for that novel. The, the comparison between them, it, it feels like comparing classical music with hip hop. Like you, you don't do that, do you? Absolutely brilliant novel. Two that you should just go out and pick up. Last month, Kevy was sending me Voxer messages because she was reading The Count of Monte Cristo. And at the start of this month, I finished George, which I really did enjoy, if you're wondering. The combination of George and Kevy made me want to reread The Count of Monte Cristo. Now, I was a little bit hesitant of this because I read it so long ago, and I've always wondered, is it my favourite novel because it's good, or is it my favourite novel because it's the first really good book I I read, you know, is it like, once you have that first amazing experience, remember your first trip overseas, the first time you saw another culture and you had that culture shock and you're like, whoa, and then you try and get it and you go somewhere else and you're like, yeah, I, I can see that that's cool, but I just didn't feel that whoa emotion because you're already a little bit, you're always chasing the hit, you know? Heroin's never as good the second time round. And, and that's sort of why I sort of thought that maybe The Count of Monte Cristo wouldn't stack up. Um, additionally, my second favourite book ever is Middlemarch, and I reread Middlemarch, and I still think that Middlemarch is an absolutely incredible, one of the best books that I've ever read, and I have read it twice. Uh, so both times one of the best books I've ever read, but it wasn't quite as good the second time through, and I took different things out of it. So I thought maybe, you know, time of life, you read it and what's going on, and different characters speak to you and all of that, and maybe, maybe I just read The Count of Monte Cristo at the right time. All of those doubts, all of that doubt, I, I just love this book. This book is just so satisfying. It's, it's just so good, and it does not feel like the 1500 page chunker that it is. It just feels so satisfying. The plot is always moving. You you understand who the characters are. Duma has weaved these cool themes of power and vengeance and what do you do and does revenge even make you happy? What does it mean to be a human? Where are your responsibilities? Where do they begin and end? Uh, absolutely wonderful, wonderful novel. Uh, and I've spoken about it before on this channel, but it is still my favourite book of all time. Wow, this has been a long video. If you have watched to the end, thank you so much for watching all of this. I hope it edits down to something shorter than 80 minutes. Bye.